The previous section introduced the basic terminology of causal relationships. Beginning with this section, we're going to start studying a number of techniques, called Mill's methods, that can be used to help identify where causal relationships exist. Now in the textbook, these methods are represented by tables. Sometimes students find these tables confusing, particularly when it comes to trying to figure out which method is being used in any given example. So here, we're going to represent the methods a little bit differently. The lesson is going to be that to figure out which method is being used, we need to pay careful attention to what's happening with the independent variable. So let's begin then with the method of agreement. In this example, we see that we have three cases. In case one, a waffle iron is on, a TV is on, and laundry is running. In case two, the waffle iron is on and laundry is running. And in case three, the waffle iron is on, the TV is on, and the hairdryer is on. In all three cases, a circuit breaker has been tripped. Now pay attention to what's happening with the independent variable on the far left, namely the waffle iron being on. Notice that it's present in all of the cases. If you find that in an example, that is, if you find that there's an independent variable that's present in all of the cases being looked at, then that's method of agreement. So what this shows is that we have some evidence for the claim that the waffle iron being on is what's causally responsible for tripping the circuit breaker. By contrast, let's look at method of difference. With difference, to make this simple, we have two cases. In case one, we have sesame seeds, rice, milk, sugar, salt, and butter that's being used to make rice pudding, and the result is a bitter taste. In case two, we have all the same ingredients except for sesame seeds, and we find that the result is that the rice pudding is not bitter. Notice how this is different from method of agreement. With method of agreement, the independent variable that we're testing for is present in all of the cases. All of the other independent variables vary across the cases. By contrast, with difference, the independent variable that we're testing for differs across the cases, and all the other independent variables are held the same across the cases. So this gives us some reason to think that it's the sesame seeds that are responsible for giving the rice pudding a bitter flavor. Remember that agreement and difference can be combined to produce the joint method of agreement and difference. In the example that we have here, Mary has eaten three breakfasts. In the first breakfast, she had coffee, eggs, and bacon. In the second breakfast, she had coffee and pancakes. And in the third, coffee and a yogurt parfait. In each case, she felt jittery afterwards. Because she had coffee all three times, the method of agreement is being used to suggest that perhaps that's what's making her feel jittery. However, this isn't particularly strong evidence. We can make it stronger by adding in the method of difference. Notice that with the method of difference, we begin by taking her first breakfast, coffee, eggs, and bacon, and then having her eat another breakfast of just eggs and bacon. We remove the independent variable that we're testing for. That's where the method of difference comes in. And what we find is that when coffee is removed, she doesn't feel jittery. We then do the same thing with the other breakfasts. With breakfast two, she had coffee and pancakes. Now she just has pancakes and she doesn't feel jittery. In breakfast three, she had coffee and a yogurt parfait, but in breakfast three prime, we remove the coffee, she only has the yogurt parfait, and she doesn't feel jittery. So notice how combining agreement and difference provides us with much stronger evidence for a causal relationship. The fourth method is concomitant variations. With concomitant variations, the independent variable that we're testing for is going to be present across all cases. In that respect, it's similar to agreement. However, what makes it different from all the other methods is that the independent variable is going to exist to different degrees across the cases. So what we're looking for then is whether the effect also changes in degrees with the change in the independent variable. So what we have here is a change in altitude. The suggestion is that as altitude increases, the feeling of sleepiness also increases. So this provides us some evidence 
that increased altitude makes people feel more sleepy. And finally, we have residues. Residues differs from the other methods because the assumption is that we have some independent variables that are producing an effect. And what we want to try to figure out is how much of a contribution one of those independent variables is making. So on the top row, we see that a truck with its load has a certain weight, specifically 20,000 pounds. However, when we remove the load, the weight of the truck by itself is only 18,000 pounds. So by method of residues, we can conclude that the load, that is the residual amount, is responsible for 2,000 pounds. Hopefully, this alternate way of looking at Mill's methods will help you to identify which of Mill's methods is being used in particular cases. In the next section, we're going to see that not only can Mill's methods be used to figure out when causal relationships do exist, but they can also help us figure out when causal relationships do not exist.